Hello, Mike here. Uh, it's been a long time since I've done a video, especially an opinion piece. Uh, sorry about the mess behind me, just doing a bit of work here in the house and moving rooms, etc. But I've managed to get most of the video set up back up. Uh, it's not the best at the moment, it's not the highest quality I've ever had, but it's good enough to get these videos done. So a friend of mine sent me a link to to this website. Um, so DSLs are a waste of time. So this is Lee Briggs. Lee Briggs is very, very smart. Um, very, very smart indeed. I'm just going to, uh, where am I here? I'm just going to move myself up to here. Make that look at that like a live streamer. Look at me go. So I'm just going to move this up here so you can see the text. We're not going to go over this entire article. It's quite interesting. So September 4th, so very, very recent. It's only a day ago. Uh, Lee Briggs uh, works at Pulumi. So he, he works for Pulumi. Very, very smart guy. Read read quite a lot of his blog posts. Agree with a lot of things he says. But this is definitely one of those things I don't agree with. So he doesn't really like domain-specific languages like Terraform, HashiCorp, like HashiCorp's configuration language, HCL. He doesn't really like them. Uh, he's clearly got a lot of opinions on them. And he's very interested. It's very interesting he comes up with this because obviously what HashiCorp did recently was changed the Terraform terms and conditions to the to the business user license thing. And so that's obviously made the open TF project fork off over to the left and gone, well, we're just going to run with our own. So they created a fork and they've, off they've gone with that fork and they're now developing that down, down the line. And uh, good luck to them. Maybe I'll look at OpenTF at some point in the video to see the, to see the differences. And I, certainly this channel will definitely be covering the difference between Terraform, HashiCorp's Terraform and OpenTF. But I don't want to discuss that, the licensing change or what my opinions on are right now. I just thought what I want to address what Lee is talking to here. So it is interesting. So he doesn't really like uh, DSL. So what's the problem? Well, I've had a quick skim through the through the thing, but I've, I've heard the same arguments over and over again. DSLs are everywhere. Configuration, complexity clock and all this kind of stuff. So I like the way he, I just wanted to look at this example. We can see here where he's got, you know, uh, he's got a route table association and second second route table association. He's got a count here. He's got a coalesce list. He's got this element and so on and so forth. And then he goes on to say, you know, this is uh, you probably a whole bunch of reasonable questions like what is a count? What is a coalesce list? What is an element? What is a local? And then he goes on to explain, doesn't really understand these things and, you know, what are the alternatives? And obviously it's Pulumi and Pulumi allows you to use, you know, JavaScript, Python and so on and so forth. But there's a bit of an issue with that. So, first of all, the problem isn't so much the language itself, in my opinion. Uh, wh why are we using count here? Go read the documents and go use count. Why are we using uh, coalesce, list? Co coalesce list? Well, go and read the documents and work out what it's doing. Play around. Uh, what is element? Go read the documentation. What is local? Go and read the documentation. Learn the language. So, just go away from that now. So, it's the same with Python. You could argue, why is everyone using why is everyone using uh, why is everyone using Rust or why is everyone using Go? Python's so much easier. What does a borrow even mean? What what's in, what does mut mutability even mean? What does it mean to borrow something? What what's this this crazy Go thing where you can do Go and then a function uh, Go thread? What's that? That doesn't mean that because you don't understand it that it's, that it's a bad choice. In fact, the problem with the, the the actual benefits of DSLs is that they stay consistent inside of the organization across organizational units and teams within that organization if you have a very large organization but also between organizations completely isolated disconnected unrelated um organizations so as a consultant and a contractor i move around i move around quite a lot and if i went from one company to another and company a were using palumi and company b were using palumi doesn't mean anything just means they're using palumi these guys could be writing it in javascript these guys could be writing it in python i don't know javascript so how do I go from the Python company to the JavaScript company? We're using Pulumi. Great. I passed the interview. Yeah, I know Pulumi. Yeah, I do a lot of Pulumi, blah, blah, blah. Great. Welcome aboard. So we've written everything in JavaScript. Don't know it. Don't know JavaScript. Sorry. So do I just now go and learn JavaScript? So problem number one is that there's no consistency in the choice of languages that can be used between organizations and even organizational units within the same organization. Even teams on the same floor inside the same building sat next to each other can choose both to use Pulumi and use completely different languages. But that's only problem number one with using an imperative language to define infrastructure. Problem number two is what standards do you write the language to? I was saying to a friend earlier, okay, well, we'll, we'll use Python. Okay, to what standard? Should I just everything be defined as, should we use classes to define our, our infrastructure? Should we use classes to define some sort of service or problem domain? So we have a problem of, we have an app that requires a load balancer and an auto scaling group with a multi-AZ RDS instance. It requires a couple of S3 buckets. 
it requires a cloud watch group that it goes off to it also pushes to external external api somewhere else pulls data in and it also uses batch jobs as well okay so how do we define that in as much of that as possible in, in infrastructure with code using something like Pulumi if we agreed to use Python. So, okay, do we define the whole solution as a class and then the methods inside of that class are various parts of it? Do we go sort of just functional program? What if we use functional programming within within Python? Because it can be done. What happens if I'm new and I come in and I see that you've used Python, but you're using like function decorators and I've got no idea what a function decorator is. And I'm like, I have to go, go out and learn what that is just to be able to deploy the infrastructure and what about um list comprehensions and i what if i don't know what that is what about anonymous functions and lambdas how complex does the language get between two teams could agree we're using Pulumi and we're using python they can implement the same they can do the same thing implement the exact same infrastructure in completely different ways so there's just no consistency between it and it actually introduces way more problems than it does solutions Problem number three is I, we can't even get software right, let alone our infrastructure now being defined within something like Python or JavaScript. The problem you have is software of, in and of itself is hard. We we I'm doing university at the moment, and I've just done an assignment where I had to use a, a strict design pattern to implement a simple 2D game, text-based text -based 2D game for a 2D board game, and I just didn't use a design pattern at all. I'm not a professional software engineer, but I didn't need to. I was able to implement that with AI as it requested, full undo, redo, move history, saves to a file, you can load the game back up again, keeps track of the score, denounces the winner when there's a winner, it supports multiple games. And that was easy, I didn't need to use any design structure. So if I can implement that and I don't even need to use what are considered to be object oriented programming design structures, like design patterns that we use, like behavioral pattern and the, the factory pattern and all this kind of thing, I don't even see that being used. We sort of just, not with, with to a degree, we sort of just make that stuff up as we go along. So if we're doing that in our software for the actual critical stuff, the actual business machine that takes user input, does something with it, put, stores it, and then says to the user, give me money. The thing that actually generates money for the business. And now we're looking at our infrastructure and going, let's write that as code. Great idea. Let's use the same language. We, we can just about get that right. Like we just about get that part right. And now you wanted to make the same mistakes and bring the same thing here. When there's really no need... Because your infrastructure just doesn't really mutate or change anywhere near as quickly as software does, which is point number four. Software written in Python, Rust, Go, Java, PHP, whatever you want, C, irrelevant, right? Whatever the language is, software changes quickly and often and quickly. And it, it, you iterate on it really, really fast. It, it, it moves. It moves at a, at a measurable cadence. Infrastructure doesn't okay there will be some organizations that will have very very fast moving infrastructure they spin stuff up really really quickly they run a small campaign maybe even like a marketing campaign to spin up some infrastructure they run my campaign campaign for a week and then they burn it again uh, sure okay absolutely i've been i've worked for over well over 20 organizations now as a contractor and i've never seen anyone do that it's always some sort of fixed infrastructure somewhere along the line that, that makes up 95 percent of the entire solution and so why do we need a language that's designed to iterate and move quickly when we can just use something like a DSL? So point number five, just to wrap up this video, it's getting a bit long now, is quite simply, if you can't do what you need to do for your infrastructure as code with Terraform, then I'd probably say you're doing it wrong. If you need an imperative language in order to do, to, in order to implement your infrastructure, then I'd say, and you can't do it with the DSL like HashiCorp configuration language or something similar to it, then I would say that you just, you, you're doing it, or you're overthinking your, your infrastructure. Now, don't get me wrong, certain situations may change that, and maybe I'm underthinking it, and I'd be I'd happy to hear a comment from Lee down in the comments below, if you want to have a chat, Lee. Uh, I can even get on a channel, we can have a we can have a talk over Discord or something, it'd be really interesting to hear what you've got to say. But So maybe I'm underthinking it, but ultimately, I think that this stuff just does not change enough. It doesn't, it doesn't move around violently enough just like code does we don't need to iterate it all, all that quickly especially now with the move towards cloud and especially with the move towards platform engineering where you build a kubernetes cluster and you deploy everything on that maybe that's, that's not again it's not the right answer for everyone but it is most of the market let's be honest so i don't agree unfortunately sorry mate um again i, I i'm not saying that i'm being sincere when i say your work's really good i love all the rest of your blog and all the rest of the stuff and you know everything you've, you've talked about here is is is, is fantastic um, but with this particular thing, I just as a contractor, I just think it's a very, very bad idea to use an imperative language to define your infrastructure. I just don't, um, 
don't see a benefit to it whatsoever. In fact, I see nothing but negatives, unfortunately. But uh, happy to be corrected. Let me know in the comments below. Uh, I'm going to be setting up Upload Academy soon. I'm going to be setting up community.upload.academy. If you want to go over there and register, that would be great. It's going to be coming very, very soon. It's going to be our private mentoring service. It's going to be very, very cheap. You're going to be able to come in and you're going to be able to go from zero to DevOps engineer relatively quickly with a clearly defined roadmap and all your resources all defined for you. And you're going to be able to ask questions right there and then and get some professional answers. So I guess that's today's sponsor. Hey, otherwise head over to the DevOps lounge. So if you go to discord.gg slash DevOps lounge, that's our public discord server. It's got about nearly five and a half thousand members now. It's booming. Hop on over if you want to have a chat. That's also where you can come and comment on this video if you'd like. Have fun. And if you're using Plumy, good luck.